got three fun, uh, great speakers tonight, and they can come up if you want to sit at the front here. It'd be great. Good evening. We're so glad all of you joined us tonight for this special event sponsored by the Up County Prevention Network. Tonight we have three very knowledgeable experts who will help us explore and better understand vaping technology and its health impacts, the addictive nature of vaping technology, and the extent of vaping usage among our youth. A word first about UPN. The Up County Prevention Network was ably led by Charlotte Dodger, who's here this evening, and we're so glad she's here. We have a board and many members, and many of them are here tonight helping out, and I want to express my appreciation for them and their help. Also, the PTA and Mr. Carruthers, the principal for the high school, for their support as well. A quick overview regarding vaping technology. Many of you know about the technology, but in essence, instead of cigarette smoke, a user inhales an aerosol that is produced from a liquid that is heated by a small electronic device. The devices are now so small that in some cases they are the size of a thumb drive. There are a wide variety of vaping liquids on the market and people can and do modify their devices to atomize and inhale many different substances, including marijuana. Authorities have blamed vaping for a rash of recent lung injuries and deaths thought to be linked to products, in some cases containing THC and other elements, and the primary psychoactive ingredient in marijuana as well. At the same time, the use of nicotine-based e-cigarettes, such as Juul, has skyrocketed among middle and high school students, leading authorities to react due to the risk of addiction and potential harms. States, including Michigan, Massachusetts, Oregon, and Montana, have initiated bans on flavored vaping products or on all e-cigarettes. The rash of recent illnesses and deaths from vaping, particularly among our youth, have made it seem as if the industry has completely eluded government oversight. E-cigarettes, however, are actually regulated by the FDA. In 2016, the FDA assumed regulatory authority over the products and the agency immediately prohibited selling cigarettes to those who are under 18. E-cigarettes currently on the market are required to display, display a warning label stating they contain nicotine and their makers must submit a reading list to the FDA, although these lists are not public. Even so, it's true that e-cigarettes are not well regulated. Unauthorized products often enter the market, and underage sales too frequently occur in stores and online. And the government treats e-cigarettes like tobacco, not pharmaceutical devices. So they escape the FDA's safe and effective standard, meaning many products are dangerous inherently because they're not tested. The products contain THC thought to be responsible for lung injury outbreaks are not regulated by federal agencies, since marijuana is a Schedule I drug and it's illegal. So with that as a background, we have three excellent speakers tonight. We'll start off with uh, Travis Gales, who's the Chief of Public Health Services at the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services. I first met Travis uh, probably a couple of years ago now, and he was helping to initiate and manage a study that the county did that looked at health outcomes in the county on a zip code level. It's really groundbreaking work. Uh, it looked at areas in by zip codes, so we actually had a much better sense of what the health outcomes were throughout the county on a more local level. And unfortunately, in the case of Poolsville, the area around Poolsville, we don't do too well on some of the health outcomes, and I'm not sure if Travis will touch on that or not, but that certainly was a, a kind of a shocking thing to us when we looked at the data. So we'll start off with Travis, and we'll go next to Dr. Kenneth Fetter. He's the CDC's Epidemic, Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer for the state of Maryland. In this capacity, he works in Maryland Department of Health's Infectious Disease, Epidemiology, and Outbreak Response Bureau on outbreak investigations and emerging disease threats. He has led Maryland's response to the ongoing outbreak of severe lung injuries linked to vaping. And prior to joining the CDC, Dr. Fetter completed the PhD at the Johns Hopkins Bloomsburg School of Public Health. And finally, we'll have Dr. Barbara Brookmeyer. Dr. Brookmeyer is a board-certified physical family physician and serves as the lead health officer for Frederick County. In the role of health officer, she directs the Frederick County Health Department's seven divisions and their numerous programs, including immunizations, WIC, cancer prevention, emergency preparedness planning, children's dental services, well and septic inspections, substance abuse prevention, mental health counseling. She has been involved in family medicine as a public health official in Frederick County for a very long time. So we'll start with Dr. Uh, 
Gales, and uh, yeah. I think Dr. Gales does not have slides, the other two speakers do, and then what I'd like to do is certainly I'm going to have some questions if we don't have any from the audience, but I hope you have questions, and if you do, we have people that will be having cards that they will have that you can actually take and write down your question, so I will have them up here and I can read them off to the speakers and they can respond to them. So with that said, Dr. Gales, you want to start? Pleasure to serve as your county health officer and chief of public health services. Um, as Link mentioned, we have been working very hard over the last couple of years uh, to redefine how we look at health and how we look at problems that impact and influence our health outcomes across the county. You may have heard repeatedly over the years that we do pretty well when it comes to health outcomes. We're proud of that. We celebrate that. We celebrate being Maryland's healthiest county or one of the healthiest counties in the state as well as one of the healthiest counties across the country. But when we look at that, we know that there are pockets within our communities that don't enjoy those great overall averages. And because of that, we have been utilizing data to tell a different story, to highlight where there are pockets of need and to slice those pockets of need into different ways so that we can have a better understanding of what the needs are of our communities um, and have a better understanding of what we need to do in terms of ramping up our effort to address both acute and chronic sets of health conditions and health outcomes so that we can be healthier across our communities. One of those issues is the issue of vaping, uh, and which is symptomatic of a larger conversation of substance use and the need for behavioral increased behavioral health and mental health services across our community, particularly as it relates to youth and adolescents. So the comments I want to make, and uh, we are going old school with no slides, um, my set of the presentation are from the perspective of the public health charge. Um, also informed by, I happen to be a pediatrician and I specialize in adolescent and young adult medicine. So the 16 to 24 year old folks are my people. Uh, and so anytime we see things that disproportionately impact young people, that gives us a sense of, of alarm and extra urgency uh, because it's our job to make sure that they get to adulthood safe, healthy, and able to be productive adults with great futures and ultimately take care of us when we get older. Uh, that said, when the, the vaping issue uh, has been around for a while. Uh, when when e-cigarettes first came out, as, as for those of you in the audience familiar with the tobacco legislation that passed for years, uh, I actually grew up in Southern Virginia, tobacco country. Uh, and when those, those first sets of lawsuits were coming through, folks in my area were, were impacted by that and fought it. But one thing that we did agree on, or lots of people did agree, is the fact that advertising was disproportionately targeting young people and getting young people to use those substances at an early age. Uh, well, similarly, similarly, since e-cigarettes and vaping products have been on the market, there has been a significant increase in the amount of advertising targeting young folks. We know young people up until October 1st of this year in the state of Maryland had to be 18 to purchase tobacco related products. And now that has increased to 21 with, with a few exceptions. Uh, but it got on our radar because we knew that there were high amounts of advertising targeting young folks. And last year around this time, we had a couple, there was reported a couple of incidents at uh, a couple of high schools of students who lost consciousness secondary to vaping. Now, how many, well, I won't say how many of you, but how many of you know someone who smoked a cigarette before that's uh, tobacco-based, nicotine-based? Right. Did any of them lose consciousness secondary to smoking that cigarette? No. So scientifically, you should not lose consciousness smoking a tobacco, uh, nicotine-based cigarette. So that caused us to be concerned about there being other substances in the vaping products that folks, particularly young people, were using. And at that time, that caused us to pull together uh, experts, including council members, representatives from the county executive's office, uh, law enforcement, tobacco control, 
alcoholic and beverage services, and members of our school system as well as the academic community to come together to figure out what's happening in our community. And so that group met in uh, early February and it rung an alarm and raised the level of awareness for a lot of different folks, particularly our policy makers and advocates within the community. Uh, and got a lot of people working around that to try to figure out how do we raise awareness in the community and get a handle on the, the scope of the issue. One of the challenges uh, is related to the issue is it's difficult to get good data in terms of how many folks and how many young people are using the substances. That's one of the challenges that we're hoping to, to get better in your jurisdictions, uh, to get better data so that we can uh, design interventions that are effective in addressing the particular needs um, at that, that point. After we brought, we came together as a group in February uh, and we were ramping up efforts to raise awareness within the community, we got a report again of three students, uh, this time at Churchill High School um, in the county, who had been reportedly vaping earlier in the day uh, and lost consciousness again and required naloxone to be administered to revive them, to wake them back up. Now, that again seconded our concerns from the November incidents because we were hearing that students were using it but hadn't reached the level of concern to require the locks or the loss of consciousness. At that point, uh, we released a public health alert uh, to the community to educate folks and again, raise awareness about the issue. And particularly as Link mentioned, a lot of the different methods and modules that kids were using are things that we don't pay attention to. They're USB ports, or USB, they look like USB ports. Uh, they're vaping, uh, the, the, the smoke is clear, so it's difficult to know exactly when a student is using it or when a young person is using it, um, and what types of things uh, go into that. And so after the public health alert, we also uh, worked very closely with our colleagues in the school system to educate uh, teachers and paraprofessionals within the school setting to be to increase their alarm and awareness of what's happening um, and to also release more information and make more information available to parents within the community. Now fast forward, we have been working uh, very closely with a number of schools um, in addition to the school system uh, to develop policies that address this uh, as well as again raise awareness. We are uh, hope to be announcing very shortly a a competition for young people to design public service announcements to re get more information uh, to their peers about the risk. We've had several testimonies both at a local level and a state level about the risks of vaping and uh, tobacco usage. And I, I, I won't steal Dr. Dr. Brookmeyer's thunder, but some of the things that we're concerned about is early initiation and exposure to nicotine, because early initiation and exposure to nicotine can cause impairment uh, of, of, of development of important parts of your brain, the prefrontal cortex. It's what helps us make, it, make good decisions as adults. Uh, early initiation also can predispose young people to starting other substances that may be a little bit more dangerous. Uh, and we also know that it increases the level of addiction and withdrawal to nicotine in and of itself. Uh, but then there's that fourth component of we don't know what people are vaping and juuling. And the concern, as Link mentioned, is what is included in those substances um, and what, they, what might they be laced with. And we don't have any way of knowing what's in there and, and being able to uh, educate young people about the risk of that. So fast forward, those are some of the tools that we have, have been working with. I am working to instill. We work very closely with our council members. There has been legislation that has been proposed and will be voted on uh, in the near future that aims to uh, decrease and uh, significantly impair the access that young people have to these products. Uh, and that has caused a little bit of controversy, but from a public health perspective, uh, when we know that something is disproportionately impacting a segment of our population, it's our job to make sure that we do what we can to keep them safe and um, to, to decrease their access to those particular products. The last piece, and I know that uh, this will be discussed in more detail, is as all of this process has evolved, we have seen the increase of acute injury, uh, acute respiratory injuries and pulmonary injuries secondary to vaping. 
Now, in addition to the neurological impact on development of nicotine and vaping initiation, we now see acute injuries that are causing, there was a patient, and I believe it was Michigan, who received a double lung transplant secondary to uh, vaping-related illness. Uh, and we, in the county, we have had one case so far that we worked closely with the state to investigate. Um, and that individual was in the 18 to 22 year old age group, was a college student, uh, was significantly ill, fortunately has recovered, uh, but was ill for a course of three weeks, um, in and out of the hospital, uh, requiring intensive care, level uh, care and treatment. Uh, so just want to let you know that we are very aware of this in the county. We're working very closely with our peers and colleagues in other jurisdictions in the state uh, to address this from a legislative perspective and a disease investigation perspective, as well as an education and outreach perspective. Uh, and I will defer to my colleagues for, for their presentations, but we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have about what we're doing here in the county. Abby is right there. If you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. She will give you a card and you can write it down. And if, I, I do want to encourage the audience to participate. So next we'll have Dr. Fetter and then uh, Dr. Brookmeyer after that. So you want to speak here? Or speak up there? I actually walked around. Okay. <laughs> the clicker uh, better here if you want. Can folks hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I can't sit still. So my name is uh, Kenny Fader. Uh, I, uh, uh, like Link said, uh, I uh, technically work for the CDC, but I'm placed here in Maryland at Maryland Department of Maryland's Department of Health, um, where I have a title called Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer, which basically means I work on sort of unusual health problems and try to help figure out what's going on so we can keep the public safe. Um, and so as part of that role, uh, I've been the leader at the state health department uh, investigating the ongoing outbreak of severe lung injuries that have been linked to vaping. So just by a show of hands, how many folks who are here have seen stories in the news about people becoming extremely sick and potentially needing to go to the ICU? Maybe to, okay. Great, link to vaping. So my job here in the state of Maryland is to identify folks who are getting sick, um, keep track of what's going on, share information we gather from that at the CDC and try to figure out what's going on here in Maryland and work with my colleagues from across the country to try to figure out what's been causing people to become sick so we can stop it. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you guys about for about 30 minutes is you know, what have we seen so far? What do we know? What should we do about it? And, you know, try to cut through some of the misinformation that's out there and talk about what it is we think we know and what it is that we don't know and yeah. take it from there. So let me start by giving a little bit of background about e-cigarettes and vaping. So when we talk about e-cigarettes, we base or a vape is any device that produces an aerosol by heating a liquid that contains chemicals to be inhaled. So e-cigarettes are the device, vaping is the act of using the device. Okay, so what's actually in the, the, the substances that people are vaping? So most commonly we hear about nicotine, then also cannabis derivatives, like uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, so that's THC, which is the psychoactive der uh, ingredient in marijuana, or cannabidiol is another substance that people are sometimes included in vaping liquids, or CBD. And then you also see products that contain flavorings, um, and purportedly contain no substances and they're just inhaled for the flavors. Although sometimes it turns out those products do contain nicotine too. Um, and most flavored products do contain nicotine. And then the key point here is whatever else is in there. And one thing we're gonna talk a lot about tonight is we don't really know everything that's in there. Uh, and so that's been a root cause of a lot of the problems that we're seeing. So this just shows some pictures of the types of devices that exist on the market, and there's actually some samples outside, so I'm really grateful to the folks who brought those. You can take a look at what these devices look like. But the point is, unlike cigarettes, which basically come in one shape and size, they come in many shapes and sizes, um, and they're designed typically to be sleek or attractive. There's a lot of technological innovation in this industry. They're often small. Sometimes they can look like USB devices or pens or other easily disguisable devices. Um, and that's sort of a feature of the product for the users because it means they can be taken into spaces where you might not otherwise recognize them. So I just want to draw a distinction quickly between two important products we're going to talk about. One is Juul. So Juul is the most 
popular e-cigarette on the market. About two years ago, I think they had almost an 80% market share. That may be down a little bit. Um, and jewels often look like flash drives like this, and they come with what are called pods. These are disposable pods. So the device is reusable, but the pod is disposable, and you buy the pods and you insert them in the device, and then you use the device to inhale the substances in the pods, and the substances are nicotine and other flavors designed to make them more appealing. And then over here, we have pre-filled cartridges of THC oils, okay? And these are often uh, come used with what are called vape pens or vape pen batteries. Um, these products are, the Juul products, the nicotine products are legal, um, but they're not legal to sell to children. The THC products are for the most part not legal unless you are a part enrolled in Maryland's medical cannabis program. Okay, so it's important to have some background about youth smoking. So smoking is declining dramatically among youth, and we actually just this year hit historic lows for youth smoking, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and marijuana use among youth is pretty much constant, any marijuana. Vaping, on the other hand, has taken off uh, pretty spectacularly among high schoolers than smoking cigarettes. And we also see Although vaping, uh, measuring this just started last year, increases in vaping marijuana to about 10% among high school students. Okay, so what's the concern? Teen cigarette use is down, that's a good thing. Teen marijuana use is not up, that's also a good thing. E-cigarettes contain fewer harmful chemicals than cigarettes, that also, in my opinion, is a good thing. But what is in the vaping product? The problem is we don't know. And if we don't know, it's hard to know what's safe and what isn't safe. And so the problem is, is that with vaping, we are the experiment. The product test is going on in real time among today's users. We don't know net what the long-term health effects of vaping are. And as a result, today's young people, among which is becoming increasingly popular, are the experimental subjects for the companies that are selling these products. Um, and that's not the way we want to test products, is by just putting them out there and seeing what happens to people's lives. Okay, so let's talk about the ongoing outbreak of lung injuries and deaths that have been linked to vaping. So, in, on the 8th of August, Wisconsin announced the first instances of three young people who were hospitalized with very serious lung illnesses after using e-cigarettes or vape. Um, and all three um, of these young people, I believe, I think all three, but the typical presentation is young people come into the emergency department, or any person who has a history of vaping, with an illness that looks kind of like pneumonia, sometimes also has gastrointestinal symptoms, problems breathing, um, and they're often just given antibiotics or other medications and sent home. And then they subsequently get worse, they don't improve with the antibiotics, and they end up going back and being admitted to the hospital. And sometimes they need very serious respiratory support, like they need to be put on breathing tubes or other supports like that. Uh, artificial lungs uh, and other very serious respiratory supports. And sometimes they're in the hospital for months. So on the 16th of August, Maryland heard about these reports from Wisconsin Department of Health, and we launched our own investigation to try to figure out if this was also happening in Maryland, because we've heard reports of it happening in other states as well. Now, so we developed a case definition in partnership with the CDC to try to say, okay, this is what we're calling a vaping-associated lung injury, okay? So that means you have to have been um, vaping in the 90 days before you got sick, okay? You have to have visible signs of lung injury on a chest x-ray or a chest CAT scan. And then there's a little more complicated piece to this, but basically we can't find any other explanation for why you're sick. So you test, you don't test positive for the flu, you don't test positive for other infections, you don't have, uh, you don't have any some kind of autoimmune disease that's just developing. We can't figure it out, so we think, okay, you have this lung damage, it must be attributable to your thing. Okay, so on the 23rd of August, Maryland identified its first case that met this pattern. It's somebody in their early 20s who was hospitalized in July, shortness of breath, cough, fever, chest pain, headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, ended up spending more than three weeks in the hospital, part of, part of it in a coma. So 
well, the way we identify this is they had an abnormal chest for x-ray that looked kind of like pneumonia, but turned out to not be pneumonia. They had their infectious disease history. They could not find any evidence of infectious disease. And the person had a history of AIDS. Hospitalized for several weeks, required mechanical ventilation. So on August 28th, Maryland issued a press release warning the public, saying, you know, we're concerned that we're seeing an outbreak of these severe lung injuries that are potentially linked to vaping. Uh, at this point, we'd identified five cases in the state of Maryland. At this point, we don't know what product, device, or substance is causing this. In other words, we can't hone on a particular thing. So we said the best choice is to keep yourself safe, don't vape, don't use these cigarettes. So on the 30th of August, we sent out a letter to every clinician in the state saying, describing this illness presentation, saying we think we might be seeing a new illness emerging. Please contact the Department of Health if you see anybody who looks like they have vaping-associated lung injury. And then the CDC subsequently sent out a similar alert, saying clinicians, you should be on the lookout. We've seen these lung injuries across the country now. Please contact your local health department if you see somebody who looks like they've become sick after vaping and you can't find any other explanation. So then on the 6th of September, Wisconsin and Illinois, where this outbreak started, collected information from dozens of people who had become sick in their states, and they published a journal article describing what they saw and sort of providing a better set of information about what were the risk factors associated with this injury. So what did they find? They find that 80% of the people who became sick with this new lung injury or illness reported vaping THC. Remember, that's the active chemical that's found in marijuana. And only 60% reported vaping nicotine. And then particularly, 37% of these people who got sick reported that they only vaped THC versus only 17% who said they only vaped nicotine. And so we said, okay, we think it's too soon to say for sure. We certainly can't say that nicotine products are safe, but we think the greatest risk factor here is probably vaping the THC-containing product. Now, on September 6th, we got a second important clue, which was that a public health laboratory in New York was able to collect a number of these vaping cartridges from people who had become sick. And they isolated in those cartridges uh, a chemical or a, a compound called vitamin E acetate. And this was found in uh, the overwhelming majority of the cartridges that had been used by people who became sick and that were supposed to contain THC. And that did also contain THC. So, so what is vitamin E acetate? Um, so vitamin E acetate, so vitamin E is it's a nutrient, it's found in your foods, it's found in all sorts of things. Vitamin E acetate includes in as dietary supplements, um, it's in certain skin lotions. Uh, and so it was actually advertised as a nutrient. So it turns out things that are safe to eat are not always safe to inhale. Just the same way you wouldn't inhale when you heat your dinner to hundreds of degrees and inhale it. Uh, vitamin E acetate, which for all we know is safe to put on your skin, is potentially now implicated in this rash of vaping associated lung injuries. But we can't be sure yet because it's only been found in some of the products by people who became sick. So then on the 2nd of October, based on the evidence that was coming out of the CDC and the information that we'd seen from our own cases in the state of Maryland by looking at their medical records, we put out new guidance for clinicians. And on October 3rd, we officially, the secretary declared that this was going to be a reportable condition for the state of Maryland. So now, if you see somebody who you think has vaping associated lung injury, you must report it to the health department. And you have to report anybody who meets the test that we have a formal case definition, so I won't talk about that too much, but we formalize the criteria about who needs to be reported to the health department. So on the 4th of October, CDC published new data. And again, they found very similar findings to what they saw in Wisconsin and Illinois. So 70%, 77% of the people who became sick reported using THC versus only 57% reported using any nicotine. And similarly, exclusive THC use was more common than exclusive vaping nicotine. Okay, so fast forward to November 8th. We finally, after four months of investigating this outbreak, um, had a breakthrough. 10 states managed to collect uh, lung fluid that had been taken from people who became sick in the course of their medical care to try to figure out what was going on. 
take that lung fluid and send it to the CDC, including three people from the state of Maryland. And so we ended up having samples of lung fluid from 29 patients across 10 different states. And we ended up finding that 100% of these uh, people whose lung fluid was sent to the CDC contained vitamin E acid. And so we were able to link this contaminant that was previously found in the THC vaping cartridges to the lungs of people who actually became sick after vaping. So do we know that this is the cause of lung injuries linked to, well, let, let's do this in a couple, let, let's well, get to that in a second, but what do we know now? Where are we now? So as of today, Maryland has identified 49 cases of lung injuries associated with vaping in our state. 75% male, 20% are minors, 80% have had to be hospitalized, 94% report using nicotine, 77% report using THC, and 18% report using CBD. So we're a little bit different than the country in that actually our cases are more likely to report that they use nicotine than that they report THC, but we think that's just because we've only had about 50 cases, and so it's a pretty small sample, and so we basically think that the risk factors for getting sick in Maryland are probably the same as the risk factors for getting sick elsewhere, and the fact that we happen to have a few more nicotine than THC cases is probably luck of the draw. Okay, so this just this graph here just shows the evolution of the outbreak across the country over time. So each bar tells you how many people got sick that week. So we can see here in June, a few people getting sick, July, a few people getting sick, August, things really taking off. So here, this red bar shows when things first started. Then here on September 6th, right at the peak of the outbreak, we have for the first time say, oh, maybe vitamin E acetate is involved. These companies, which had been sort of loosely selling vitamin E acetate online, not clear to whom, they took their websites down and they disappeared. Um, and then the number of cases nationally started falling, um, and then finally, uh, in November, we did find vitamin E acetate in people's lung fluid. But at this point, 2,051 people across the country have become sick after vaping. Uh, and the outbreak has not stopped. So even though we have seen this decline, or we think we're seeing a decline, there are still people who are becoming sick after vaping. Perhaps fewer than before each week, but it is still definitely a very serious concern. Okay, so what do we take away from this? Oh, finally, a quick point. So there's a number of brands that have been frequently implicated in this outbreak that you may have heard about reading news stories in the media. Things like Dank Vapes, Rogue, and TKO. So these are brands of THC cartridges. So it turns out that THC brands are not actually brands. In other words, if you buy something that says TKO extract cartridges, it may not be made by the TKO extract company because you can buy an empty TKO cartridge online if you're a private individual who sells drugs, fill it up with something you made at home and sell it like it's something else. And so people were buying these products thinking that they came from legal cannabis dispensaries in states where these products are legal, when in fact they were just buying them from private sellers with absolutely no quality control in the process, in all likelihood. Okay, so let's dive into some of the, what I think are most, the most important questions, the lessons learned from this. Okay, so how can you stay safe? What's the best way to stay safe? Well, the best way to stay safe is don't vape, don't use e-cigarettes. Did vitamin E acetate cause this outbreak? In other words, can this all be explained by the one substance that's been added to these vaping cartridges? So it certainly seems like vitamin E acetate and THC might explain most of the outbreak, but we don't know for sure, and we might never know for sure. Um, in part because, thankfully, things appear to be getting somewhat better. Um, and certainly, again, there is that 10 to 20% of cases that appear to be linked only to nicotine products which don't contain vitamin E acetate, and so we're still doing a lot of work to figure out, is this part of the story? Is this most of the story? Is this all of the story? And if it's not all of the story, which I think we think is probably not all of the story, what else is it that potentially causes people to get sick and die? Okay, so, was this all caused by cannabis products? So again, remember, THC had the greatest risk, but one in 10 cases nationally don't report vaping cannabis. We're still trying to figure this out. Again, this is linked to the, what I just said about the vitamin E acetate being added. What should 
medical cannabis patients do. So Maryland has a medical cannabis program where you can enroll and with permission from a physician, buy cannabis product from a licensed dispensary and use them for various health conditions. So our advice is, you know, we are concerned about vaping cannabis since we don't know everything about what's causing this illness. If you know somebody who's enrolled in the program, they should talk to their physician and try to make a decision that meets their individual health needs. Because people, different people have different health needs, and at the very least be aware of the potential safety risks that come with the products and monitor themselves for symptoms. Now, so never vape cannabis products purchased out, oh, and I'm sorry, the second point, never vape products purchased outside the licensed Maryland cannabis dispensary, because we know those products are linked to these blockages. The products sold on the street are definitely unsafe. Okay, our nicotine e-cigarette safe them. I've talked a lot about these cannabis products. So safer than smoking doesn't mean safe. And if you don't use e-cigarettes, our advice is don't start. And when I say that, you know, we, these, these products are often marketed, unfortunately, I think as a health product. You know, they say, this can help you quit smoking. And from that, people take away that these products are safe. But being safer than cigarettes is the lowest possible health standard because there is almost nothing that we know of that's worse for your health than smoking cigarettes. And so certainly, um, if you are not using these products yet, it is best not to start using them. Okay, so what about folks who are using e-cigarettes to quit smoking? We get this question, should I go back to smoking cigarettes? No. <laughs> Don't go back to smoking cigarettes. That's the worst choice. Instead, we think the best choice is to try using other FDA-approved quit aids. So that's things like nicotine gum, patches, lozenges, other prescription medications that have been approved to treat nicotine addiction. Um, we want you to help to help you quit smoking. We want to help you quit vaping nicotine, and there are options out there, and it's something folks can talk to their doctors about. And in particular, if folks are looking, they're trying to quit cigarettes, but they can't, or they're trying to quit using e-cigarettes, but they can't. There are 24-7 resources. You can call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. It's called the Quit Line. They offer free 24-7 evidence-based counseling. They offer free quit aids, so they'll mail you things like gum, patches, and lozenges, and can help you try to quit as well. So that's basically all I have to say, and I want to make sure there's time for questions and answers, so I'll stop and turn things over there to Dr. Brookmeyer. Sure was great. Now, for any young persons out there, you can uh, maybe see and hear some of the excitement of what it's like to work for the CDC and the Epidemiologic Intelligence Service. It really is uh, like what you see on uh, TV, some of those investigative things. So I'll fill in a little bit more and repeat a few things that we've heard already, um, including Right, this one goes through a few. Looking at all the different types of products, which again, please go out there and take a look. Um, so there's been an evolution in the products and the products are actually still evolving. And at the very end, I have some information about the really the next generation of these types of products. Um, and if you haven't seen them before broken down, this is a diagram of what it looks like. So some of the features that they have in common is that they have a battery. Now the battery might also be one that it's rechargeable and that's what uh, folks are plugging into their computers to heat that up. But they have a battery that heats up the, the coil. It's often a coil called the atomizer. So when that heats up the e-liquid, then that's what uh, uh, then ends up going through the cartridge and produces that aerosol. So that's sort of a diagram of the inside. And what's already been mentioned is that um, those products, the, the chemicals, the liquids, they're not FDA approved. And you are, anybody who's vaping is essentially being the guinea pig for the company. And Juul, so I do wanna bring up, and there are examples out there of what the Juul pods look like. And just to give you an idea of uh, some of what's going on, if you wonder, well, how much nicotine is in there? Well, so in the very middle there, you can see that one of those jewel pods has about 59 milligrams per milliliter of nicotine, and that's about equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. 
And so it is not uncommon for young persons and adults to be going through at least one of those a day. So you might think it's just one small amount, but it can, the equivalent though, is of a pack of cigarettes. And there are just more examples of what they look like. And again, if you see it in the computer, yeah. There you go. So the trends, what you've already seen, so this uh, goes from 1997 to 2018, and so this is specifically looking at youth, uh, youth smoking, youth tobacco, and then vaping, and you'll see how now that vaping has been a question that's been asked on the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey, uh, we can see what, where the trend is going. And, and I perhaps went a little too fast, but 26% of youth, or 27%, said that in the last 30 days they had uh, vaped or used an e-cigarette product. So that's what, one in four? Uh, and then, um, so taking a look at the years from 2011 to 2019, first looking at cigarettes, and then looking at the e-cigarettes, and we see how, uh, where we've gone in 2019 is the e-cigarettes e have surpassed in years of um, cigarettes, and it's been going up. And then you say, so what about those flavors? Well, we've got the fruit, and the menthol and mint, and the candy, and we see the fruit's been pretty popular, but what's come up here? Uh, surprising is that menthol and mint, and that will become important when different uh, legislatures are talking about banning flavors, and some of them are looking to exempt or not ban the menthol and mint. Um, and so that will be controversial, and I expect we'll hear some of that this year in the Maryland General Assembly if some, if there's a proposal to ban flavors. So, We've already covered, are they harmful? So I have to say, so going back to the 1950s, there was already research how tobacco was harmful. And then it wasn't until 1964 that the Surgeon General issued a report on tobacco smoking. And then, you know, it, back in 2016, we're still talking about uh, the impact there. Uh, and in this case, the e-cigarette use. And, uh, and then in the reports, you know, there are some things, something that we didn't talk about here today was that some of these devices, so those batteries, they can end up exploding and so they cause burns in people and some problems. We also haven't talked about yet tonight how um, anybody who gets access to the containers that have the liquid uh, can be poisoned by it. Uh, and so, like, so, you know, really, what is that risk? And when we look at uh, what's coming out. So when you heat the, the products, when you heat the, the glycerol in there um, to try to get that, so it, uh, when you heat the glycerol and one of the other chemicals that's in there to try to give you that nice cloud, some people think, well, it's just, it's just vapor, it's just uh, heated up water. Well, it is not just like vapor coming from a pot there. What it has actually suspended in it are potentially some number of all these chemicals here, including cancer-causing chemicals. So acetaldehyde, acrolein, um, uh, formaldehyde. So things that you think, well, you certainly don't want to inhale that, and you don't want to have that in your lungs. Um, and when you think about how much um, somebody using uh, a cartridge a day could be getting the equivalent of, uh, well, getting a much higher amount than what OSHA permits for workers in an industrial location to have in a day's exposure, day's worth of exposure. People using these devices are getting more than that uh, warning level. Uh, and so then uh, Dr. Fader talked a little bit about the what was described as the popcorn lung. Um, and so the youth risks. And so Dr. Gales also talked about the youth risk there. So what we do know is that the adolescent brain isn't fully developed and actually it's the decision-making part of the adolescent brain. 
Uh, it's not fully developed until adolescence at about age 24, 25, and tobacco does, or the, the nicotine, does uh, specifically interfere with the synapses. That's the nerves, the neurons in the brain. That's what you know, makes our brain work. Uh, it actually interferes with their working. And uh, it can contribute then to depression, uh, in, uh, reduced impulse control, so the mood disorders, uh, and also is, uh, uh, has been associated with potentially increasing the susceptibility to addiction uh, later on. And uh, also, uh, as was already mentioned, if you are using e-cigarette products, then you're also uh, at a greater risk of uh, 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 smoking tobacco products and then also uh, illegal substances. And so what's in the products? So <laughs> what's interesting is uh, when, uh, I think it was a study that the CDC had done, they, they even looked at products that said no nicotine, you know, that the label said no nicotine. Most of them had nicotine in it. And so, uh, and unfortunately, when youth were surveyed, uh, that, um, and they asked, well, do you, what do you think's in there? And they're like, oh, I don't know, just flavoring? Mm -mm -mm. They had the tobacco. Uh, and mental and poison control has gotten a lot of calls. Um, and so there we already talked about, so again, what risks are, have uh, been associated with uh, the use of the electronic uh, smoking devices? So we see that other undesirable um, activities are associated. And we've already covered that. Uh, and so again, so this is additional data looking at youth. Uh, if you, are you asking about, so are you gonna start smoking cigarettes? Well, if they were an e-cigarette user, mm -hmm, they're likely non-user, not quite as likely. And you can see they sort of look alike. Uh, so again, what Dr. Cutter had said that, you know, What's safe versus safer? Uh, we're not going to say that e-cigarette use is safe. Um, and when you look at the marketing tactics, there are some great ones out there. I know we have a lot of questions though, so I'll go through these. Uh, and we'll talk about all the marketing practices that are specifically tailored to hook people. But what I will say though is for Juul, they've been very creative in um, their uh, scientific development. And so one of the things when we've seen that increase in the e-cigarette use and Juul is um, fueling a lot of that or the use of Juul is they formulated their product so that it's a much smoother uh, experience. So it actually deals with the acid base uh, balance, the pH scale. And so they were able to change the pH of the liquid product and that, um, that change um, then produces for the individual who's inhaling it a much smoother or less irritating uh, inhalation, and that's been a significant contributor to the popularity of jewels, in addition to the flavors. And, you know, calling them juice and it's trendy, you know, all those flavors. Um, and so we covered all of that. I did want to just, I have just two slides on the medical cannabis in Maryland because it's important. Uh, I believe that um, talks about, so what is approved in Maryland? So from, from the bona fide dispensaries in Maryland that have product that was grown in Maryland and produced in Maryland, not from any other state or any other country. Um, and uh, the point here when we're talking about youth use is minor patients, so that's their under age 18, they're not allowed to self-carry or self-administer medical cannabis. So if someone says, oh, I have a prescription to use this, well, if you're under 18, you actually are not allowed to self-carry and not allowed to self-administer. And it's not permitted in schools, also even if it's medical cannabis, the students aren't permitted to self-carry or self-administer. So then, so for this, so why are teens using it? And perhaps we'll get to that with the audience discussion. You know, what have you heard? Why are teens using it? But 
you know, the what we found in the gear is my friends are using it or I wanted to try it. The flavor sounded interesting. Uh, and isn't it safe? Everybody's doing it. But what we have seen from the research, and this actually goes for alcohol use as well, is that um, teens, when they know that their parents disapprove, they are less likely to uh, engage in that behavior, whether it's uh, alcohol drinking, and it's also coming through here with the, uh, the tobacco use and the e-cigarette use. So it's not 100%, but it definitely reduces the likelihood of their engaging in those activities. But some other reasons that youth say that they're not using you know, minor health effects, cost, um, and so when we talk about cost, we've had those uh, tax, you know, increasing the taxes on tobacco products and alcohol, that um, those are, have been effective public health strategies in the past to reduce youth access. And we'll end here with some things about talking with youth and some things. So, you know, it sort of just follows basic good parenting advice about anything, uh, which is, you know, be patient, try to be non-judgmental, listen, and, you know, when you don't know the answer, you know, be honest about that, but you can all both together research that. Um, you should be expecting, and I haven't gone to all the places in town here to see whether they have these signs up. They should all have these signs prominently displayed, the new Tobacco 21, because um, we do have retailers in town that sell these products, so we should make sure that they have the right signs up and that they are also checking the age. Um, oh, because um, I do want to point out that even purchasing the uh, associated equipment um, if you're under 18, you're not even allowed to purchase that. Uh, and so that went into effect already. Uh, so like I said, um, I do want to get to, we do have a special, uh, uh, the tobacco quit line for, oh, uh, let's see, I've got the youth one. So the tobacco quit line is free, and then we have the vaping one. Let me just go back. Uh, then there is, sorry, right, I'll just click through. I want everybody to see for the teen youth line. Oh, oh there we go. Uh, so we also have in Maryland four teens, a specific text line for teens um, who are using tobacco products and also vaping. Thank you, those were excellent presentations. Um, before I throw you any comments on what you saw on the slides or what the other speakers said. Sure, I think uh, as Dr. Bookmeyer pointed out is that we are focused on a, a particular activity right now. But I want to be very clear is that the larger conversation is about substance use in adolescents and young adults overall, and substance use being a proxy for greater concern about underlying mental health and behavioral health concerns. And one of the things that I hope is a part of the conversation as we move forward isn't just about the vaping component, but it's about making sure that young people have access to folks to talk to, access to services to support them and help them deal with the daily stressors that they go through um, and encounter. Um, and, and we have to make sure that when we talk about these, these programs, that we also talk about making sure that we support inpatient and outpatient psych services, um, increase access to counseling and support services, as well as thinking through other strategies, utilizing peer networks, peer uh, navigators, and things like that to help with those underlying things. Travis, that was a great point, and actually it's interesting because um, when Adina Levine was here as the principal and she was leaving, getting ready to leave, we had a discussion with her about um, one of the ideas that we've been pushing in the uh, for the Poolsville High School, and the new ones we're hoping to get, is a wellness center. 
and wellness centers exist in four of the high schools right now, and a lot of the focus in the wellness centers is in fact counseling, mental health support, those kinds of things, and we're hoping to get that if we get into high school, which we look like we're moving in that direction. But I don't know if you, any of you looked at wellness centers, but I think they're pretty effective, can be pretty effective in supporting you. You mentioned, uh, Travis, and I think this is a good segue into some of the questions here, that there's a term I saw when I was doing some research for this uh, in, the, in the addiction community called common liability, the idea that certain people are simply more likely than others to engage in risky behaviors. Um, do we have a good sense of what those behaviors might be in teens that they would exhibit that would help us understand as parents and as friends? You know, are they likely to be engaging in some of the kinds of behaviors you're talking about? Sure, well, I, I think, you know, I don't have teenagers at home, but for those of you who do, you know that they don't always talk to us and tell us what's on their mind. So they communicate in other ways that are screaming out for help. So for example, when you notice your kid has a favorite activity and all of a sudden they're just not that interested in it anymore, or they um, were participating in something that they have decreased um, interest or energy um, a desire to participate in. And those are the kinds of things that can be symptoms and clues to let us know that there is something deeper and going on. Um, if you notice changes in their scholastic activity, uh, their athletic performance, if they are a performer in some type of, of way, uh, those again are, are, are things that can, if we pay attention to, pay close attention to, they are saying, hi, I have an issue of a problem and I really, really want you to talk to me about it without saying hi. I have an issue or a problem that I really need to talk about. Uh, and I think that that is just something that we have to have increased and heightened awareness to make sure that we're paying attention to. Um, because again, a lot of times, even in situations where there's something that happens and people say, well, we didn't know, there are oftentimes signs and symptoms that the, the child, the adolescent is displaying that is crying out for help. Uh, one of the, there are several audience questions raise this over and over again, and I didn't do, I'm not an expert on regulation in this field at all, but some of the initial research I did on it suggested that the FDA does have some oversight authority, but they don't really regulate based as they do for medical devices on the safety and health effectiveness of the devices. So they don't test them. We don't know how safe they are inherently, but I, the questions in the audience, several of them repeatedly asked, why are they allowed to sell these devices? Why are they allowed to sell products that we don't even know what's in the products. Even if they've listed the ingredients, it may not be that much of an advantage since a lot of them do damage. I mean, we don't know what it is, but I, I know you're not lawyers and policy people, but still it would be interesting to understand better why, how they're not really looked at very carefully by the government, it looks like anyway. Sure, so, so I can take that one because I work for the government. I mean, so I, it's a great question. Um, I mean, so I, I can't speak to why folks are allowed to sell these devices, but I think the way to one important thing to think about is the distinction between the standards that exist for medical products and then the standards that exist for everything else. Um, so when you come up with a new medicine, you as a, as a company, you must do many, many studies to show that your medicine actually cures an illness or prevents an illness. And you also must show that your medicine doesn't have other negative harmful side effects over a period of time. Uh, and that's the FDA approval process for drugs. And that process is, you know, you have to demonstrate that your product works and that it does no harm. For basically everything else that the FDA regulates, the standard is, is gonna be more like, well, it's up to you as a consumer to decide whether to use this. You have to just show that there's no reason to affirmatively think that it would be extremely harmful. But obviously there are things that are FDA approved, like cigarettes in the sense that they're sold, they're not illegal, that are extremely harmful to your health. And so I think the trouble with these products is in part because I think they're sometimes marketed <laughs> as health products, even though they are not approved as such in the United States. There is a perception that they are harmless, or at the very least just sort of fun, um, when the fact is, the truth is, they're just like other legal but dangerous products, where not only are there risks that we know about, but because they're new, there are risks that we don't know about. 
And so when a product is new, sometimes it can be sold to the public as, well, this has no known health harms. Well, it has no known health harms, but it has unknown health problems that come from inhaling all sorts of things that previously people weren't inhaling before, and we don't know what they'll do to you. And so that's why we see something like a, a spurt of lung injuries linked to vaping. Well, before this, I couldn't have told you whether or not inhaling vitamin E derivatives was any more or less dangerous than anything else. Now I'm going to tell you, don't do it. But when you have dozens and dozens of chemicals or additives that go into the product, just by grab bag or walk up to the drawer, you're going to have bad luck where some of them are going to cause people to become sick or have negative health effects over the long term. I wanted to add is, and to that, so that's the, the, the legal side of things. The other concern that we all highlight is, is the fact that there are substances that young people are using, not only young people, but adults as well, and it's unclear what's in those substances. So for example, I may be, have secured something legally through what, I, what appears to be an FDA approved pod, but it has a liquid in there that is laced with some other additives or chemicals. We live in a region where we have been significantly impacted by additives being added to other substances. So for example, there is, if you've heard of things like spice and K2, synthetic cannabinoids, a lot of those have lots of other chemicals in there that cause negative side effects. So when I was talking about losing consciousness and needing naloxone to be administered, so losing consciousness was referring to passing out uh, and naloxone being administered, being able to, that was required to revive the, the, the individuals because there was concern about respiratory compromise um, and then being, being out of it and some other some neurological symptoms. But want to make sure that people understand is that when we're talking about, you know, the other side of things is, again, we live in a region, we've been impacted by that. When we talk about opioids, for example, a significant reason why opioid deaths increased over the last several years was the introduction of fentanyl and other products into things like cocaine and heroin, things that you know are dangerous but took on an even more significant level of danger when those other things were added. And that's what we keep when we keep talking about the concern about what's being added into the substances that kids and other people are using. That's the concern because we have no idea what those are and we have no idea how potent or um, significantly dangerous those substances are. I, can, I, can I just add two quick, quick things to that? Because I actually think it, it touches on two very important points. So the, there's this question of why, why, are, why are these products legal if they're dangerous? Well, the products that are, have been most linked to this current outbreak of lung injuries actually are illegal. It's not legal to sell THC vapes for recreational use uh, in Maryland. But they're still pretty easy to obtain. They're still out there, and because they have all this pretty branding on them, they look like they're legal products, and people who use them may assume that they're from places where they are legal. And so if we're gonna address this challenge, part of this is the regulatory side, but another part of it is you know, addressing those common liability, coming back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, taking a look at mental health problems and underlying concerns that may be driving people to compensate by using cannabis or nicotine. And I guess I would be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, many people saying, well, I'm using it to uh, stop smoking cigarettes and uh, cut down. And people cite uh, recent the New England Journal 15, you know, when they did look at abstinence from, uh, uh, from smoking at one year, the, 18% of the e-cigarette folks um, uh, were, uh, uh, let's see, how did that go? So uh, looking at abstinence, 18% of those using e-cigarette products were still abstinent at one year. So only 18, so I'd say only 18% were abstinent at one year. And then when they looked at those using nicotine replacement, 9.9% were abstinent. But what isn't being advertised is that when they looked at one year and they looked at who's still using the product, so those of those who were abstinent at one year, it's because 80% of them were actually still using the product versus the nicotine replacement ones where at a year's time, those that were abstinent or not using the product, only 9% 
of them, or I mean, those who were abstaining from tobacco use, uh, only 9% on the nicotine replacement were still using the product. So unfortunately, people really aren't tapering down. There are a few who are tapering down and getting off the product, but it's, they're still using it, still using tobacco. So it's really not helping to quit. Again, I'm not uh, familiar with this necessarily, but I understand that we do have uh, dispensaries in Maryland now for medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. One of the people in the audience asked, if there are eligible for medical, if you are eligible for medical marijuana, are there vaping products that are safe? I don't even know if you take medical marijuana smoking it, but <laughs> if you do, are there any safe products? Uh, so the answer is that, um, so there are vaping products sold through medical cannabis dispensaries. Um, you know, if you are enrolled in the medical cannabis program, it's because you have a health need that your physician thinks can be addressed with cannabis. And there are alternatives to vaping also in the medical cannabis program. And um, we know that the products that are not being sold through the medical cannabis program, in other words, the products that are sold on the street, are dangerous. So the first point to make is do not use the products that are sold on the street to self-medicate. Now, in terms of what product you choose to use as a person who's enrolled in the medical cannabis program, we can't say that vaping medical cannabis products is risk-free, and we think it's a decision that you should make in partnership with the doctor who is your supervising physician in the medical cannabis program. In other words, talk about what it is your personal health needs are and what products are necessary to meet those health needs, rather than just saying, well, since it's a medical product, they're all equally safe. You want to make a decision that best meets your needs and not think of any of them as risk-free and really try to pick the thing that best meets your health need while still staying safe. And that's a decision that's not made on an individual basis. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned in my remarks at the beginning, again, research I had done uh, was I'm not an expert, but I did get some information about the FDA's oversight, and it did say that the agency prohibited the selling of e-cigarettes to people under 18. Mm -hmm. I guess that's a nationwide ban; it's not a state by state thing. Uh, and we know kids go online and buy things, so I'm assuming because there's so many of these products out there in their hands, and they're probably getting them mostly online or from older people, older friends. How, in other words, how, how does this happen? I mean, there's a, a huge influx of this into their hands, and it's illegal. And I would assume they would, if they were Caught with it, they might have some legal legal repercussions too, or do they? Do you want to make that? Sure. So first of all, it's not. Um, so in Maryland, it's illegal to sell tobacco products to anybody under the age of twenty one, not eighteen. So we have a higher standard in the federal government, and that includes e-cigarettes. So it is not legal to sell e-cigarette products to anybody under the age of twenty one. We have a higher standard here uh, in Maryland, which is a great thing. Um, uh, in terms of, is there, oh, but I'm sorry, I should clarify, there's not, the onus is on the seller. In other words, we're not going to punish kids with criminal penalties here in Maryland for using these products. The responsibility lies with the seller not to sell the products. Now, in terms of how does it happen, I think there's a lot of uh, belief that in the general public that most of these products are sold online. That doesn't appear to be the case. Most products are just bought at gas stations, either by people who are, in, you know, or at the convenience stores or other stores where either they're not following the law because it's not adequately enforced, or somebody older buys the product and gives it to somebody younger. And if you kind of think about it, that's what people have been doing with cigarettes for years, right? It's always been legal to sell cigarettes with minors. We know that the overwhelming majority of people who smoke cigarettes started before they turned 18 years old. It's the same kind of process that can go on here, where just because it's the law, that doesn't mean the law is enforced that way in terms of who gets sold to. So that, if you, for those of you who have followed local uh, legislative efforts, so the efforts to address vaping in the community uh, by the council includes a piece of legislation that prohibits the sale of these products within half a mile of schools. 
and a large part that's why it was introduced because there is a significant amount of purchasing that goes on in these places um, and kids go where they may have easy access to so if I can walk during a break between school or lunch or before or after school uh, they can easily get them uh, the law enforcement, local law enforcement works very hard to uh, they use a host of different tools. Um, they do guest shopping in those places, um, and they offer citations to those places that do sell, sell uh, to those under age. Um, and so I think that there are multiple steps that need to be put into place to address and curb access to it. Um, but one of the other things that has been reported anecdotally by law enforcement is that unlike tobacco, with vaping, the age, the early age of initiation goes lower. So, you know, when talking about smoking cigarettes, you typically think of, well, that's a high school thing. They're reporting that the middle schoolers who are vaping and uh, distributing products within their, their circles. So you can think of someone, as you said, getting it from an older relative or someone within their community coming onto campus and then dispersing and selling it to their peers. Uh, and you know, when we're having the meeting, we're talking about 11 and 12 year olds who are dealers within their middle schools um, providing the substances to their peers. So can I ask for clarification? So is it a current legislation that's being considered by the county council to restrict the sales within a half mile of a school or high schools? Any school in the uh, any school in the county. So thinking about for Poolsville within a half mile, then that would potentially uh, eliminate the availability of the sales in town. So if we're thinking about, especially if at least the current uh, experiences uh, that a majority of folks are getting them from the you know, nearby stores rather than online, that could do a lot to reduce the access here in Poolsville. Barbara, in your comments, you were talking uh, in terms of parents and um, how to help with their children in terms of the, these issues. That one of the things that the, the student, the, te uh, the teens mentioned was that if their parents disapproved, which I would assume they would anyway, um, that they were more um, less likely to uh, want to engage in this behavior. Are you saying there that they really need requires the parents to actually sit down and talk to them about this actively about vaping or? Is it just generally talking about addiction kinds of things, activities, risky behavior, in other words? It's best to be clear. So with youth, uh, sometimes it's surprising what they may be thinking and that it may not, you know, I know with my own kids, it might not be what I was thinking. Uh, but to be very clear, because this is, it, it's a significant enough of an issue that you want to make sure they understand that they know what your position is on that, and uh, that if they find, but also if they find themselves in a situation where, like a, a friend was sharing with me that um, her middle school kids called her, they had just gone to a party, they uh, called her and uh, said they wanna come home, and so she's like, okay, because uh, she had already talked with them, had an agreement, you can call me anytime, I will not ask questions if you want to tell me about it. I am here to listen, but I will pick you up and won't ask any questions. And then so she had picked them up and then they did um, share with her how at the party they didn't feel comfortable because there was um, some of the kids there had big pens and that they were passing it around and you know, they didn't feel comfortable. So it's, you know, so it, in middle school, it turns out it's not too early to start talking about well, what if you do go somewhere and people are doing something that you don't feel comfortable with, whether it's behaviors or actions, or you know, drinking, smoking, you know, that to encourage your children to feel comfortable calling you if they don't feel comfortable with the situation and they wanna get out of it. Uh, and then the other is to let them know what your position is. It is difficult, so, you know, for parents, if you if you are smoking or you're vaping, it is always difficult to say to a child, "Well, do as that doesn't go over well." Um, and so there are resources for parents as well, and there are some great websites for that uh, have information for parents. And I think I have some up here. Uh, well, I guess I should say the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has something 
and then, um, uh, but then there are some that are specific to addressing the youth population, and they have some talking guides for parents that, um, uh, including so uh, people who have kids who are in uh, preschool. Uh, it's an opportunity to talk about uh, appropriate use of medications then. So when we talk about, you know, do you, uh, you take a medicine, so typically kids of that age, they have a fever, but then we can talk about, okay, so this is a medicine, it's for fever, you only take it when you have a fever, and only, you know, uh, an adult gives it to you, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So in our everyday lives, there's a lot to be able to talk about that helps to lay that foundation for the, the trust and the openness and for the young person to understand their parents' position on uh, these questions. One of the things that's uh, confusing too is that uh, my grandfather smoked for years and he always said that we knew smoking was dangerous even before they found out that it probably causes cancer. He said, I was not feeling good all the time. I was having a hard time breathing. Um, but it's, it's interesting when you look at you, with, Vaping, though, it seems like a lot of the problem is just the fact that it seems like it's so safe that it's, you know, not, you're not doing smoking. You, you don't have people collapsing, as you mentioned, Travis, or becoming unconscious when they smoke cigarettes. So is vaping more dangerous? And is it because it's an aerosol and it gets into the blood better? I mean, what is it that's causing this kind of damage to the lungs? So I also, I, I'm happy to say this. Like, I could say this an unlimited number of times because I think it's the most important message we make. So first of all, Smoking is terrible for your health. <laughs> and so the, it's almost hard to, it's hard to come up with almost anything that's worse for your health than smoking. Uh, safer does not mean safe. So there are health risks associated with vaping. Uh, we've been talking about them all night. I'm not gonna come out here and say, don't vape, it's more dangerous than smoking because we absolutely don't want folks switching back to smoking. But if you don't vape, don't start. It, it, we may find out that it is safer, but it is definitely not safe in the sense that it carries no health risks. And we've seen all the potential unknown health risks in the course of this outbreak. Those are most of the questions I've gotten from the audience. We had a, a, quite a few questions too, though, about um, the illegal nature of it and why it's being sold in the country. I think we've covered that the best we can. Uh, of nature, not the illegal nature of the product, but the illegal, the, the fact that it's not regulated by the government very carefully. So. Uh, I'm not sure we can go into that much more in detail. Is there anything else any of you in the panel want to mention or any comments that anybody made that you want to uh, comment on before we close? It's 5 till right now, so. Not to sound like a broken record, but as a pediatrician, talk to your kids, find out what's going on in their lives, be there to support them, and help support community efforts to increase access to treatment services and behavioral health services that will help them deal with the things that they deal with on a daily basis. So I want to make two final comments, one specific, because I know that we keep coming back to this point about regulation, and it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And so I, I just want to touch on it one more time that it, the things that are legal are not always Safe, and that's the unfortunate reality we live in. As public health professionals, we want to do the job of getting the word out about things that are out there that are can be sold but should not be used. And so, it's really, really fantastic for having a meeting like this, so that all the three of us, as public health professionals, have the opportunity to come up here and say, you know, e-cigarettes may be for sale, but that doesn't mean you should buy them. And the second point I, I just want to make, and I think this is a broader point, uh, is that one thing we touched, I touched on at the beginning, but I think it doesn't get enough. Is, is that youth smoking is at all time lows. Uh, so kids, great job. <laughs> and parents, great job. Like this is a fantastic achievement and we should be very proud of everything that we've done to help keep youth smoking at historically low rates. The reason vaping is so concerning is not because everything is always getting worse, it's because we're really doing better and we wanna nip this in the bud now so that we don't end up where we were 10 years ago with youth smoking. Um, we, we've made a lot of progress. We should sustain that progress by busting these myths about vaping and preventing new nicotine addictions and preventing new health harms that we don't know about. And I guess my final uh, comment then would be is that it's not as simple as just quitting. Now, some people can go the quote cold turkey, which is they're vaping, 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 and then just one 
they decide to stop and that they're successful in doing that. That is the exception rather than the regular experience. And so it does, uh, people are much more successful in being able to stop using the products if they have professional help. So the information there on the screen, um, and again, there are specific, uh, there's specific support available for teens. Uh, and we've heard that teens, um, so when they're smoking the equivalent of a pack a day or more, um, that maybe they can go an hour and a half, maybe two hours, but then they need to do it again. And that for some youth, some have reported, uh, you might have heard that on a uh, radio show recently, that they even, even needed to wake up in the middle of the night to use the weight device because they were suffering from the nicotine withdrawal. So these, so it requires for many people support, support to cut the cravings as well as then that behavioral support for whatever contributed to their starting and their continuing the practice after the addictive part um, is taken care of. Okay. You guys raise one final question, Barbara. The, uh, one of the uh, audience members said, is the quit line only for e-cigarettes or also for regular cigarettes? Is it for both adults and teens? For everybody, for everything. If you think you might want to call it, you should. If you think you might benefit from it, you should call it. It is there to help you quit smoking. It's there to help you quit vaping. It's there for adults. It's there for teens, and especially programs of people who are struggling with mental health. They can help refer you to what it is that you're looking for. The Quint Line's a fantastic resource, and I think we really can't echo enough what Dr. Kirkmeyer said, that it's not easy to quit. It's not just quitting. We really encourage you to seek professional help. Help. And that's true for young people too. I think there's a perception that young people, they say like, oh, kids, you know, you just started this, you're just being irresponsible, you're just doing it because your friends are doing it, uh, just quit. But there are chemicals in these substances that make it extremely difficult to quit. And young people also should be talking to pediatricians seeking professional help, can call the quit line. It's more likely to help you quit, and that's resources young people should take advantage of. Yes, and so I did finally find what I was looking for. So the uh, for teens, uh, smoke-free teens, they can uh, uh, text and be able to communicate that way since we know that teens like to text. So there we go. Those who are listening, uh, it says use the Quit Start app or smoke-free TXT for teens from smoke-free teens. Well, I wanted to thank our uh, speakers and thank you in the audience. I think it was a great panel and I appreciate all the presentations and the dialogue. It's been very helpful. Thank you.